our guest today is Terry Jones, the most influential art director of his generation, uh, and the man who started ID, invented ID back in 1980. This year is also the 40th anniversary of punk. Um, and when that happened in 1976, Terry was the art director of British Vogue. Um, and uh, punk um, encouraged him to have a sort of, or inadvertently, Terry had a sort of light bulb moment, I suppose. What, what effect did that have on you? While working at Vogue, I'd see uh, different photographers would come in, show their book, and um, a young guy called Steve Johnston was a student from Carlisle, and um, he brought his, his pictures in to uh, want to work for Vogue. And um, they were all landscapes or sheep and stuff like that that I said he'd never make a living on. Um, but in the papers, you know, it was full of what was going on down the, down the King's Road. And I just felt that that should be documented and uh, suggested that he goes down the King's Road, um, does two clicks max on each person and uh, takes a, the portraits just to document because if someone had done that when I was a student in the 60s, I thought that would have been a great uh, record of, of the time. After three months, Steve came back and he didn't look like he did when he first came. He had changed his hair color. He had uh, ripped his jacket, st stuck it to with, sta um, with safety pins and um, showed me the set of pictures which were the start of uh, what I felt was a, a really good document and um, I thought folks should be interested. Uh, Beatrice, were they? Beatrice freaked. You know, she freaked out because... This is, this is B. Miller, the uh, in, infamous B. Miller. Yeah, and, yeah. and B. believed everything she read in the papers um, and it was so far removed. You know, in, in uh, Vogue at that time, you're, you're in an ivory tower, you're up in, a, in an office which is, you know, full of glamour and, um, and it was far removed from what she was seeing on the street. Um, so she couldn't even enter a conversation about it. So you were interested in producing a magazine which was fundamentally about straight art photography. You got frustrated that you couldn't interest anyone else in it and you basically just did it yourself. And this was, uh, I mean obviously there was a history of, of fanzine culture in this country started with Sniffing Glue in 1977 but they're all music. So this is the first fashion, uh, fashion fanzine. The idea really was to cut out the journalist, to have it so that typical, yeah, um, you got the you know words or a, a Q and A from uh, whoever was photographed in, in the way that you might go to a, as a complete stranger to somewhere and you want to know their interests, you want to know where the music or the, where they're hanging out. If you think they're interesting and you have a like-minded uh, attitude, really wanting to get below the surface of what you saw because. The idea that everyone was just, you know, worked out the way you looked uh, was how you thought, and I wanted to get beyond that. So you had this idea, you decided you were going to um, make your own magazine. Very briefly, how did that happen? You had to speak to a, a, a printer, you had to get the finance for it. I mean, how did you afford it? Luckily, I was doing commercial work, and doing the magazine was a night job. <laughs> and, um, and then there was a, uh, enough people who, um, would come along and spend late nights like yourself and um, uh, start making the magazine happen. Um, and it was done in my studio four times a year. We would piece it together. So, you know, Steve Johnson became one of the key people, uh, James Palmer, another photographer, um, and Alex McDowell uh, was someone I'd met who was a painter who'd had his show ripped down. Um, and, um, and then bit by bit I got a, a personal assistant who knew how to type, so we had a typewriter, so uh, everything was done handmade. Now, in some respects, things have come full circle because although the future is digital, if you walk into uh, one of the few remaining book, book or magazine shops in Soho or you go to Selfridges, you'll see dozens perhaps hundreds of beautifully produced biannual 
or bi-monthly, arty fashion magazines. They're all produced on beautiful paper. They've all got uh, someone like Dennis Hopper on the cover. Um, th there's an arcane art piece, there's beautiful fashion. It's all good, it's fantastic, and it's a, it's a genuine industry. It might only be a cottage industry, but it's growing, and there is a sense that human touch is still very, very important, uh, and underground feels like print. Um, you must be enormously proud of that. Yeah, I, I always believe that you shouldn't produce something which should be thrown away. I can't stand magazines that are just landfill. And I think that um, having, or you know, looking back at the content of, of ID, um, I'm amazed actually how much great stuff there's, there's still in there. I can't go back to uh, online um, stuff from 2000, 2005, to probably even five years ago, I couldn't find it because the format's changed. I don't know whatever happened to it. You know, it disappears. And I think that as you start to realise, you know, when you can't find your phone, you know, breaks or whatever, you've you've lost half your life. Whereas if you've got a magazine or something in print, it's still there.